Today's lesson on, is on CSEC physics. I am Pithorn Dawkins. All right. Now, we're going to look at electromagnetism. It's a combination of two words, electromagnetism, electricity, magnetism. So we're going to look at now what the close relationship that exists between electricity and magnetism. Now, in this lesson, we have certain objectives that we'd want to meet. We'd want to recall that there's a link between electricity and magnetism, as I had mentioned. We also want to look at how a magnetic field can interact with a conducting wire. And lastly, for this section, we want to state how electricity can be generated from a magnetic field. But before we get to that, I have a diagram here that I've set up that we need to look at before. Now, in the CSEC syllabus, electromagnetism has a two part. You have to look at magnetic fields, magnetism, and then you look at magnetic force going into electromagnetic induction. It's quite a lengthy section of the syllabus. By right, I believe it's the longest section of the unit of CSEC physics. But before we get into electromagnetic induction, which is what I want to look at, we I'm just going to just go back over certain fundamental um, facets of electricity and magnetism that you must know. Now, here I have set up a current current conductor. Now, a current current conductor can be any wire that carries um, an electrical current through it. Now, for most persons, they associate electricity current with shocking and power in electrical devices. But behind the scenes, what you ought to be aware of is that a current that is carried through a conductor has an associated magnetic field. Yes, that is true. When a current flows, magnetism appears. They are mutually um, linked. So naturally, you would imagine that, well, if they are linked, then one creates the other, and it does. So what we have here is a situation where a conductor is inserted through a cardboard plane, which represents that flat plane, and then that conductor is connected to some power source. Power sources are usually represented by this diagram or another diagram which we go and look at. But for now, we're going to be looking at this power source. Now, this power source is considered to be a DC or what we like to call a direct current power source. Now, a di direct current power source carries current in only one direction, which is from the plus um, terminal round to the negative terminal. And we term that as being conventional current. So you have to be specific about that. Now, when this conventional current is carried through this conductor, what we have set up is a magnetic field that goes around the conductor in what we call concentric circles. All right? Now, just remember that term. Concentric circles are essentially circles that are of different diameters, but they share the same center. So because of them being of different diameters but the same center, we have a pattern that looks like this. Now, how does the magnetic field set up around this? It is given by what is called Maxwell's screw rule or the right-hand grip rule. How it works. Now, you're going to have to work with me on this. Your thumb indicates the current flow direction. Your curled fingers right, indicates how the magnetic field would set up around this conductor. So, if the current is going up and over, your thumb follows that direction. On this side, it will be pointing down. So, a conventional current represented by the symbol I is pointing down. By way of the grip rule, the magnetic field will set up going around, and if you view it from top, that will be going around in a clockwise direction. It's all about viewpoints. But essentially, when the thumb points down, your fingers curl in a clockwise direction, so your magnetic field would set up as such. And then this magnetic field is, of course, based off north and south. Just to recap a bit, the magnetic field is represented by two poles, a north pole and a south pole. So the arrows here at curl around represents how the north pole would be pointing. What would happen if we um, reverse this direction, the current that is flowing? Say, for example, now the current flows this way instead. Would you imagine that the, there would be a change? There actually would be. Let's just shorten this a bit, lengthen that a bit. We, gotta, we have to keep the conventions going here. All right, we have to show what we are setting up here. So we have um, 
switch this around. So the current that was going down is now heading up. Would you imagine that the magnetic field would change? Of course, because based on the right hand grip rule, the field now will be going instead anti-clockwise. So we just simply just rub these arrows off real quickly. And then we'd show them now going anti-clockwise. No, that would be clockwise. So that's going anti-clockwise. It's a bit messy, but just know that when it's going up like this, it's coming around. So it's going like that. All right, and then on this side, it's going up like that. Okay, so this is just a background thing. By now, you should be familiar with it. If it is not, you can read it up, but just know that a current carrying conductor, when it carries a current, there is an associated magnetic field that sets up around the conductor and the direction of the magnetic field around the conductor in concentric circles is given by the right hand grip rule thumb indicates current curled fingers indicate magnetic field now let us look at a situation where we take that same straight conductor and loop it now into a circle now this is just the top half of a circular conductor the bottom half it's not so important, but it's there. Now, if that current was carried through a circular conductor, remember conventional current flows from positive to negative. So, I is here, and I is of course going over this way. All right, so the current is going up and over. The same application that was taken here would extend over here. But no, it's not a straight conductor, it is instead a loop what would set up same thing would happen on this side when it goes up it curls around and we have concentric circles going around such as such and when we have these concentric circles the right hand grip rule tells us what is happening so we have here this section remember curls in and then it goes out that way all right now when it goes over do you believe that it looks like this let's check it out let's draw concentric circles all right now when it's here that's good when it's over here it goes the other way so instead you'd have it pointing this way and that way now why am i going through all of this when we have a situation where it's in a loop, instead of a conductor, straight conductor, in a loop, inside the circle itself, we have the magnetic field pointing in the same direction. So what we have is a situation where it sets up such. And then we have all arrows pointing the same way. And in a sense, what we're now moving toward is the making of an actual magnet such as this. Because when you remember, if you read up on the diagrams for magnetic fields, you'd see them having this basic pattern. Where we point out from the North Pole and in towards the south pole so that is why i say the arrows indicate where the north points so when we have the conductor in a loop we're now moving from concentric circles to actually having it aligning itself in such a way that it resembles a permanent magnet so once we have a situation where circles are now aligning themselves as lines then we are now moving towards the making of an actual magnet so this is some background information that you're supposed to be familiar with. Now, in terms of electromagnetism itself, with regards to, with regards to um, the topic of electromagnetism, we must look now at electrical generators themselves because we have just established that a current has an, an associated magnetic field effect. Now, the question is asked, can a magnetic field generate a current? Current gives a magnetic field, but can a field that exists generate a current? And we, it turns out that it can. This now shows the pattern as drawn here of an actual permanent magnet. And it says now, how does a magnet affect the loop of a conducting wire? 
we have looked at how a current affects the loop of a conducting wire. It generates a magnetic field. But how would that no magnetic field affect a wire that is not carrying a current? We're going to look at that. Other questions that are asked. What happens for the current to flow? Because remember, no, you know, once there's a current flowing, then you will have a magnetic field. And once there's a field, then there will be an associated current. So there are certain questions that are asked. What has to happen for the current to flow? Is it possible to increase the current? How is it possible for the current to flow without the magnetic moving? And also, how is the direction of the current flowing related to the magnet? Let us look at that. Now, it says in some background information, magnetism is closely related to electricity. Two of these characteristics combine to make one of the fundamental forces in physics known as electromagnetism. Where there's a magnetic field, there's a potential to make an electric current flow. Because once there's a current flow, then there is a magnetic field, so therefore a magnetic field can generate a current. When there is a flow of an electric current, then there is an associated magnetic field, as we've looked at already. Now, we have a diagram here showing a uniform magnetic field, and it shows how the field would point from north to south. And then we have now inserted in that field a wire. The wire is not powered. It's simply connected to something that is able to measure any current that flows through it. And we move the wire through the field. Now, by moving it through the field, we have to move in it a special way. And we'll look at what that way is. Now, let's look at this diagram. We have a situation where the field is extending from north to south, and it is actually uh, has a wire moving through it. Now, look at how the wire is moving. The wire is moving down while the field is pointing across, and by air screen, I believe it is from left to right. So it shows here a current is induced. The meter on the right is actually a meter that measures current that would flow in a wire, and it can deflect either left or right, depending on how the current is flowing. But let's just look at how that situation is. We have a field extending left to right, we have movement of the wire downwards, and we have an induced current flowing through the wire. Based off this, and based off magnetic force, and for persons who know about physics, and I hope that you would have been exposed to this, you should know what these fingers mean. Fleming's left hand, Fleming's right hand. This is for magnetic force. This is for magne um, electromagnetic induction. What do I mean by this? The thumb indicates the force that would be on a wire. Finger indicates the magnetic field. This indicates a current that would be flowing. This is for the force on a wire. And that's what, that's what drive motors and everything. So when you turn on the fan, Fleming's left hand is at work. But when it comes down to induction, we use the inverse relationship, meaning that we flip the script. Instead of current creating a force, we have what we call motion inducing a current. So it's the same thing. Force, motion for the thumb, but right hand, field is for the four fingers, and the middle fingers are the currents. So when we look back at the diagram that is here, when we look back at the diagram, we realize that the field which points to the left, the field is pointing to the left, forgive me for this whole thing, and then the motion is down, so the induced current is going that way. It's a bit yeah, it's an acrobatic thing, but you'd have to do that, all right? So here's the thing. Field is left to right. Motion is down. The current induced is going this way. And if you look at the opposite slide, the field is the same way, but guess what? It's moving up now. Before it was down, now it's up. And we have now a situation where the current will now change direction. So that is how electricity, electromagnetism works. Once you have a current carrying conductor moving in a magnetic field, then you will have an induced current. You can have a situation where no induced current is generated. If that current, if the wire itself is moving parallel to the field, meaning that the field is left to right, right to left, and it's moving, the wire is moving right to left or left to right, no induced current is generated. And if there's no motion, then nothing happens. So the only way to get an induced current, it must move what they call perpendicular 
to the magnetic field, whether up or down if the field is left or right. If it is moving parallel or not moving at all, then you get no current coming out. Now, let us look at this diagram. Since it's a case that a field is changing, because when you move the wire across a field, the field is changing. You're cutting the wire field. All right, you're cutting, forgive me, you're cutting the magnetic fields. So when the wire moves through the field, the wire is cutting the magnetic field. So the wire is causing a change within the magnetic field, or the magnetic field is causing a change within the wire. Now, when we have a magnet, a permanent magnet that moves through a loop of wire, then we can induce the current the same way. What am I getting at? Once we have relative motion of magnets with a, field, with a coil of wire, then we have induced currents coming out. Now, what am I leading to really? And this slide talks about it. Move the magnet into a coil, a current is induced. Move the magnet out of the coil, a current is induced in the opposite direction. As soon as the motion stops, the current will stop. So you have to have a change in field. Once the wire was moving through the field, the field was changing. Once the magnet is moving towards the wire away, the field is changing and an induced current will be generated. That's all you need to know. Once there's a change of magnetism in a wire, then an induced current will be generated. All right? How to increase it? We can increase how rapidly we move the magnet. So if we move it slowly, small current. If we move it fast, large current. Another way, we can use a more powerful magnet. A larger magnet will cause a greater change. Greater change, greater induced current. And the third one is to increase the number of coils or turns that is in the wire. So three things. Either we move the magnet faster or the coil. We use a more powerful magnet or we increase the number of coils that are there on the magnet. All right. Now, we're going to look at how this applies to actual coils of wire. Now, the term solenoid is simply that bunch of wires that you saw earlier on. So, this says, recall the significant link between electricity and magnetism. Magnetism generates electricity. Electricity has an associated magnetism. Good. Recognize how a solenoid can induce a current in a coil of wire. We're going to look at that. And we're going to look at now how the AC, remember, we looked at DC, we're now looking at AC. AC would now be alternating current. Alright, so just bear that in mind. And alternating means it's constantly changing. DC is one way, steady. AC, constantly changing both ways. Alright, now let's look at this diagram here. When we look at the alternating current, we have a situation where this coil is actually powering that coil. What do I mean? This has a power source connected to it. Current through this generates a field as I had shown you here. When this field is changing by way of the AC, because the AC is building and falling, it will actually cause another coil beside it to induce a current. So pretty much that is how we can induce a current from one coil to another. And when we look at the different coils, you can call them primary coil, secondary coil, so on and so forth. But just know we're going to what we like to call transformers. And no, we're not talking about Optimus and Decepticons. No, we're talking about the actual transformer stepping up and stepping down the voltage here. All right. So we need to be familiar with the terminologies as it relates to primary coil, secondary coil, and how each coil works together to create induced current from one to the other. All right, so we're gonna take a break right now. When we come back, we're gonna delve a bit deeper into the transformer and then hopefully we can now look further into an actual question, all right? As I said before, this is leading up to what I need to get to, which is talking about transformers. You see the picture in the top right hand corner? Yeah, for those transformer fans. I look like Optimus, but we're not talking about Optimus today. We're talking about the actual device that makes electricity so manipulated or manipulative because when it comes down to the transformer, it is literally able to vary or change the voltage that you want it to. Now, what is a transformer? 
A transformer consists of two coils essentially wrapped around a laminated soft iron core. Laminated means it's in sheets, it's packed together. Soft iron means that it's able to magnetize and demagnetize quickly because you'd want that for a soft iron core. Now when you look at the diagram here, we have two essential um, sections, the primary coil, the secondary coil, and in between is that link or that interacting interface that allows this to induce a current in that because the primary coil is what is powered, the secondary coil is what now the load or whatever you're powering is connected to. Now, as it relates to the symbol, there are many symbols, but the essential symbol that you're supposed to be familiar with is as such, where you have something like fingers clenched on one side, and that points to the left, that's the primary coil. There are two parallel vertical lines in the middle, represents the core, and then there's another clenched looking thing on the, si on the other side, representing the secondary coil. So it's a primary coil, the soft iron core in the middle that separates them physically, and it is the secondary coil on the other side. And the, elect um, the transformer is something that is not electrically connected. It only interacts through magnetism, and it interacts through this, um, the soft iron core. Below here we have something of a direct current symbol here that powers the S here is a switch. That's the primary coil, that's the soft iron core, secondary coil, or there is a resistor or a load. Now, we move on to an actual diagram. This is the primary section of it, measures the voltage. This symbol represents an AC source, and that is typically what is used in um, transformer applications because we need something that rises and falls, builds and drops in terms of its current. Because remember, for you to induce a current, you must have a change in magnetic field. For you to have a change in magnetic field, that which creates the magnetic field, or it's gone, that which creates the magnetic field must be changing, which is the current. So once we have an alternating current, the current within the coil changes, therefore the field within that coil will change, and therefore an induced current can be developed in the transformer on the secondary side. If you have a direct current, the transformer would not operate as it should. So the AC is what is used in transformer applications. So we have the primary, secondary, and we have the power, and we have the load, and the voltages are measured across here. Now, another term that you must be familiar with, and we get to that, is this N. N represents the number of turns of the coils. So if you have 10 wrappings, N is 10. If you have 100 wrappings, N is 100. And it is both quoted for the primary section as well as the secondary section. Now, when it comes on to transformers, there are two main types. Step up, step down. And it's not literally, they're not built to that you can step up or step down. It's how they operate. A step up transformer is one that is able to bring up the voltage output or the voltage signal from the power source. Meaning, if you send a certain voltage value into the transformer at the primary end, if it makes it larger in number, then it's a step up. That's essentially what a step up does. All right? Um, so, step up transformer is one, and the purpose is to bring up the voltage of the power source or whatever is supplied to it. And it does so by the number of turns, as we look at a little bit further. Now the other one, and it talks about it here, step up transformer has more turns of wire on the secondary coil, which makes a larger induced voltage in the secondary coil. It is called a step up because the voltage output is stepped up. So this is essentially what it does. And when you backtrack to that, if you look at here, when you count the number of coils here, if you could, if you compare it with here, you see that there are more coils here. So the step up will have more coils on the secondary than the primary for it to be a step up. More coils here, higher voltage output. All right, the next one, step down. As the name suggests, it is bringing down the voltage. So they're opposites. For the step down, you essentially would have less turns of wire on the secondary, which makes a smaller induced voltage. It's called a step down because the voltage output is step down. So when you compare the step down voltage here, we have a situation where the number of coils here are more than the number of coils here. So therefore, whatever voltage is sent here, less will be putting out here. So that is how it operates as a step-down transformer. Now, 
this equation, you know physics always carries equations, so don't worry, don't, don't start fretting. Now for those who know these symbols already, V and V here represents voltage. The P subscript and the S subscript represents primary and secondary. And as I told you, number of turns on primary, NP, number of turns on secondary, NS. So this equation, write it down, remember it. This is the transformer equation. This tells you essentially what happens within the transformer. This now is used to determine what you need to determine where transformers are concerned. So when you're working any question regarding transformers, you need to just recall this. Now it is essentially a ratio. It compares two voltages. All right, Voltage in, voltage out, number of turns in, number of turns out. There's a modification of the equation, but we, if time allows, we get to that. Now, quick question. A voltage of 240 is applied to a primary coil of 200 turns. What is the voltage across the secondary coil if it has 10 turns? Now, if anybody could guess now what kind of um, transformer this is, step up or step down? If you said step up, you would be wrong. It's actually a step down. Because if you compare the number of turns primary to secondary, the number of turns on the secondary is less, much less. It's actually 20 times less. So we find here this is a step-down transformer. And it means a step-down means that the output voltage that was powered in the primary will be less than the, the input voltage rather to the primary would be less than the output voltage. But by how much? As I said, it's a ratio. So if this is two, um, 20 times greater than that, then this would be reduced by the same factor. But when you work it out, if you say that 240 is reduced by a factor of 20, that would give us on what? And that is actually showing 12 volts. So when you divide 240 by 12, 20, you actually will get 12. But when you work it out, VP over VS, NP over NS, VS is the unknown, cross multiply. When you solve, then you get 12 volts. That's essentially how the transformer equation goes to work. Now here we have a question based of CSEC paper. I think it's from 2009. It says, the figure lower shows an ideal transformer being used to step down a 220 voltage AC supply in order to operate a low voltage lamp. So this is the AC supply. Typically, household can run of either 110 or 220. So you can imagine that this is the same thing as something that you'd power, um, use to power your home. And this is a device now that wants to step it down to power lamp. 220 is too much, so we want to step it down. And we have 1,600 turns, 80 turns. All right? So we have the question here is asked. The principles involved in the workings of the transformer and how it is able to set down the input voltage. Five marks. We're not, we don't have time to go through that. I want to go directly into the working out section of this. If you need to get clarity on this, there are ways that we can communicate thereafter. A lamp is connected to the secondary coil of the transformer by long leads which has a resistance of 2.5, and that should be ohms. The power input to the primary coil is 44 watts. It says now, calculate the voltage across the secondary coil of the transformer. If we backtrack, write down what we know. We know that the voltage, let me not use that, the voltage of the primary is 220 volts. We know that the number of turns on the primary is 1600. Just a count, so we don't need to state a unit there. We also know that the number of turns on the secondary is 80. And we need now to know what voltage of the secondary is. So we know the um, transformer equation is voltage primary over voltage secondary is equal to number of turns of the primary over number of turns of the secondary. When we cross multiply, we have a situation where V ns is equal to np vs so this now vp is 220 times n secondary that's 80 that's equal to 1600 times vs so that is 220 times 80 over 1600 all right so zero cancel zero zero cancel zero this is 1, that's 2. So that's 2 into 22, which is 11 volts, which is the secondary voltage. All right? 
So that is how that would be worked out there in terms of determining the output voltage. All right. The current in the secondary coil of the transformer. Now, a modification to the equation that wasn't stated on the slide is to add how the current would be affected by this. And a modification to it is just a simple addition, nothing to worry about major, is to say that I being current in the secondary is equal to I in the primary. Now, this is the general equation for it, considering current. All right? So all you have done now is just added current now. But bear in mind, please, if you're dealing with primary in the numerator, secondary is in the denominator. However, for current, it's the reverse. Current is in the second, um, secondary current is in the numerator, whereas primary current is in the denominator. All right? Yes. So when you're working that out, you have to bear that in mind. So essentially, you do the same thing knowing that 11 volts is here and so on and so forth. So in terms of the current in the secondary, we can, I believe, yes, in terms of working that out, no, you just simply do the same transposition that you have done in terms of uh, using the transformer equation. All right, in terms of electrical power dissipated in the lamp, you should recall that electrical power is current times V. But power dissipated can be found by I squared R or V squared over R. Either equation will give you that. All right? In terms of why high voltages are transmitted, simple. If you, get, if you have the same power, the higher the voltage, the smaller the current. Current creates a heating effect. So higher voltages, smaller current, so you have um, smaller losses when you transmit via um, higher voltages. All right. So that's all for today for CSEC physics. I hope you have grasped some of the points we have discussed. You can catch a repeat of today's lesson on JNN today at 5 p.m. and in schools not out highlights on Saturday between 1 and 4 p.m. right here on TVJ. It will also be aired on video on demand on One Spot Media. Until next time, I am Petherin Dawkins.